Dieta. Welcome to Inside Albania with me, Alice Taylor. As temperatures rise and many of us are preparing to wind down for summer, the Albanian news cycle apparently has no intention of slowing down. In this week's show, I'll be discussing the Albanian police raid on an Iranian opposition compound near Durez, the potential for blockchain technology in the Albanian property sector, and what is behind the US and EU stance towards Kosovo amid simmering tensions with Serbia. I'll also be joined by a total of four guests this week. So without further ado, let's get started. On Tuesday, Albanian police raided the compound of the People's Mujahideen Organization of Iran, otherwise known as MEK, near Tirana, resulting in resistance, injuries and one death. Now, MEK is an Iranian opposition military group seeking to overthrow the current regime in Tehran. While previously being designated as a terrorist organization, this was lifted in the 2000s and they were relocated to Albania with Western support, where they've remained in a heavily guarded compound ever since. The country's court against corruption and organized crime is investigating MEK members for six offenses, including provocation of war, illegal interception of computer data, interference in computer data, interference in computer systems, and the misuse of equipment. Police on the scene tried to seize computers and servers, but residents were unwilling to hand them over. The Albanian Interior Minister Bledi Tutsi condemned MEK for their violent response to the police operation and raised concerns about their activities in Albania, while MEK claims the police are violating their human rights and are now backed by the Tehran regime. They have called on the EU and the US to intervene. In March 2021, MEK was accused by Facebook of running a troll farm out of their base in Albania, closing more than 300 accounts belonging to members. In a statement published on its website at the time, Facebook said it had investigated and disrupted a long-running operation from Albania that targeted primarily Iran. Over the years, many questions have been asked about MEK, with The Guardian questioning whether they're terrorists, cultists or champions of Iranian democracy, and The New York Times describing a visit to their compound as propaganda sessions. Now, those who've reported on MEK with a critical view or question their presence in Albania have reported harassment and even smear campaigns. Now, in 2019, I was invited to an event at the Manza compound, and I spent a couple of hours inside before getting rather freaked out and going home early. Now, Albania's relationship with MEK has been strong up until now, while its relations with Iran have deteriorated. Last year, Iranian hackers targeted Albania's government computer systems, leading to sanctions and the expulsion of Iranian diplomats. Now, the recent raid highlights the complex dynamics surrounding MEK, as well as putting Albania in a rather interesting position regarding relations with Tehran. I have with me today online Andy Hojai, a lecturer in law at UCL in the UK. Good morning, Andy. Uh, first question, MEK blames the police and the police blame MEK for the scenes we saw this week. What's your view on what we've seen and the statements that we've heard so far from both sides? So there's been a lot of disinformation coming and it, it's a bit difficult to cut through some of those. And the issue is because the very uh, core of the deal between Albania and MEC and the partners is not transparent. So we don't quite know. So MEC is claiming that the Albanian police shouldn't enter their territory where they are staying and therefore they are violating their rights and freedoms. However, they do not have a diplomatic stay in Albania and therefore they cannot be classified as an embassy. And if there's a court order in this case where SPAC has allegedly uh, claimed, therefore the police has the right to enter and to make those searches and to, to, to make and to verify all of those uh, claims. So that's, that's the very uh, bottom of this uh, issue. Having said that, uh, the whole issue and the raid in retrospect, I'm sure it could have been handled better by both sides because we can clearly see that the violence as well as uh, the alleged uh, death in this scenario that has resulted in a very high political uh, tension. 
And I mean, that's going to be my next question. What are the political repercussions for this in terms of relations with MEK, relations with Iran, and relations with MEK's allies, for one, the US? So th this has been the biggest backdrop of this, because for a while they were kind of outside the spotlights. But all of a sudden now we have a number of statements. So, for example, the U.S. State Department has said it's entirely up to Albania now to decide what they are going to do with MEK. And the U.S. has clarified that they do not see them as the viable alternative opposition in Iran. So therefore, their position has been uh, jeopardized in this scenario. Furthermore, it has raised a lot of suspicions both by Albania and many of its allies about their activities in, in that specific compound and in terms of how they are reacting. Furthermore, we can also see in Albania, where they have welcomed them, how they are reacting to this specific clash and in terms of their activities and how it has also put uh, the Albanian national security in uh, jeopardy. Where it comes with Iran, we have seen that Iran has claimed, especially the foreign affairs spokesperson, to say, well, you are now kind of finding out what we have been saying all along. So that is, is kind of an interesting uh, dynamic. But, however, their future will very much rely on what the next geopolitical development will be, because the US and the EU is in talks with Iran, and it seems like they are going to move forward with, with the uh, nuclear weapon agreement, and therefore they could become part of some sort of uh, ground scheme deal. So we could potentially see the Iranian embassy opening up again at some point in the future? Very much we could see that, and I think we could also see some form of normalization, and that would also depend in the war in Ukraine. We are also seeing that Iran is playing some sort of a role in the background, so that, that could very much happen, and therefore their position would be jeopardized. But we could also see France, for example, which is also another big host of MEK, has stopped some of their activities in France, and is taking a bit of a, a, a back seat when it comes to their position. Uh, now, as I said earlier, Facebook sort of raised an issue around MEK in 2021 about this supposed troll farm. Um, and, you know, there are journalists in Albania who have asked questions about their presence and sort of what they've been up to while they've been here. Now, feel free not to answer. I don't want to put you in an awkward position. But do you think MEK were or are up to no good? So first thing first, I think Albania in principle has done... Uh, the very right thing to welcome them, as long as they are, are um, prosecuted politically. I think Albania would be the last country to prosecute or to judge a group of people and to generalize all of them that they might be to not good, especially given our history that we were under communism for 50 years. So therefore, we should understand and protect uh, them from that perspective. Having said that, if there are a number of them that have engaged in illegal activities and where they are breaking the agreements, they should be brought to justice. And that should, should be uh, clarified. And that should be made quite clear to them that if they're putting the host country into uh, jeopardy, and if they're having a negative impact. I mean, we saw last year, uh, after Iran cyber attack Albania, uh, the team service, people couldn't get in and out of the country, and actually happened on the very weekend where we had the most tourists in the country. So the repercussion economically were quite uh, severe. So from that perspective, it has put our position and our uh, mindset. However, I would reframe and I would kindly ask all the uh, journalists and the opinionists on this to kind of reframe for generalizing all of them, because I'm sure not all of them are up to no good. But having said that, I would very much like to support SPAC on this because it's a very new structure and it's actually taking a uh, very concrete investigation on a number of spheres in Albania. And I think we should back them and support them on this very investigation and wait for the final detail before we make our minds up in terms of what we should be doing in the future. Andy, thank you very much for your very balanced and comprehensive response there. Um, now, on to the next story, from Iranian cybercrime to blockchain. In a first for Albania, a 60,000 euro property in Vlora has been tokenized and sold with the transaction taking place on the blockchain. The company behind the exciting development, Heritage, 
also offer investors the chance to purchase and sell digital tokens that represent immovable property or a fraction of them, facilitating the diversification of assets and financial portfolios. If much of what I just said made absolutely no sense to you, don't worry, because I'm joined today by Mustafa Lani, a uh, lawyer and an expert in cybercrime and all things cyber. Good afternoon. Welcome to Inside Albania. Thanks for having me. So first things first, in simple terms, uh, for everyone out there who's not quite sure, what is blockchain? Blockchain is a system, uh, for example, like the bank, when uh, we do we make payments, and uh, every copy of our transaction is sent to the recording book. Uh, for uh, in this ta- in this uh, case, the blockchain. And um, we should be uh, very careful, and we have to do the attention that when we make a payment, well, we must be secure that every payment is recorded in uh, uh, our uh, book uh, in blockchain, because every one of us who use blockchain has uh, their own wallet, and uh, they are recording book for their payments. I think someone once described it to me as like a Google document. So, you know, Google documents. Yes. Um, it is on the cloud. You can share it with everybody. You can give permission to people to use it. Yes. And for example, I can go into the document, I can write something. And then there's a browsing history. There's an edit history. And there yes. you can see every single person who's made a change to the document. Yes. And it's with a timestamp, their name, and the change that was made. And yes. someone sort of described blockchain as this to me. You know, it's a, it's a system which records different transactions in chronological order with a yeah. timestamp, with data within it. And each entry on this digital ledger can then not be changed afterwards. So this means yes. you can't, I can't go in and delete your transaction or the no. data that you've put. So that makes it very secure. It's very secure. It, it can be deleted, but you, you have to be a very professional hacker. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but in most of cases, no. Bitcoin, Ether, etc. These are forms of digital money yeah. which um, are transacted via a blockchain. So if I want to give you one Bitcoin, I'm not that generous, but if I did want to, yes. um, I would send it to your wallet and yes. it would go via the blockchain. Yes. And that means that there is a permanent record forever that I have sent you that. Yeah, but this uh, the Bitcoin has a policy, not not just the Bitcoin, but the, the blockchain has a policy for protect for protecting us from the third parties. So yes. uh, it's a transaction that uh, it's just between you and me. Mm-hmm. In this property sale, I mentioned when I was talking about it, the concept of tokenization, yes. um, which correct me if I'm wrong, is similar to you know when you have a company like a limited company, yeah. and that is split into shares. Uh, the concept of tokenization is you could have an apartment worth, say, 60,000 euros, as is the case with this. And if I tokenized it, I could split it into, say, 60,000 tokens. They made little investments, yes. Each worth 1,000. Yeah. So if I only had 10,000 in the bank, I'd be like, okay, I want to take a 10,000 investment in that property. Um, and that's how the tokenization works. But I want to ask you two things. So firstly, this property is being transacted on the blockchain. So I bought this house from you. Um, I've passed you the money via cryptocurrency or whatever. um, And this transaction has taken place in a secure way that can't be deleted or tampered with or anything. What benefits could this sort of digital immutable process have in the Albanian property market where we have a lot of problems with um, transactions when it comes to property and people not being completely uh, legally abiding by the law? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, of course, but uh, we um, we have uh, we have been doing great steps in technology and law. Uh, we have a law called Number Sixty Six uh, in the year of uh, two thousand twenty, who is a law based technology financial market who explain all the cryptocurrencies and transactions. But uh, also we have institutions like uh, the Authority for uh, Financial Control. Who is in control of uh, currencies and payments, uh, and the banks? Uh, in this in this case, we have uh, side effects and uh, positive sides. Uh, positive sides are like uh, we um, uh, we save time because it's faster, it's uh, it's secure, uh, it's uh, private, 
uh, no third parties. But, no fees, uh, no, no bank fees. Yeah, uh, uh, actually, uh, no. when, actually, when you do the transaction in cryptocurrencies, there is a fee. Uh, depends from the coin. For example, Bitcoin has a different fee. Uh, Ethereum has a different fee when you do the transaction. It depends from the But coin. It's not as high. Uh, well, yeah, mm -hmm. and at this at this moment, <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, when. Uh, Uh, when we uh, talk about the negative sides, we, we came to uh, money laundering and um, f uh, computer fraud mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and a lot of times, a lot of people don't have the capacity to uh, know how the system works mm -hmm. and they could be a victim. Yes. of transaction. Actually, I asked on Twitter, I said to people, you know, do you think blockchain not cryptocurrency, blockchain specifically, could have benefits in Albanian society. For example, um, when selling properties, everything's yes. recorded via the blockchain, maybe educational certificates, voting, these sorts of things. And people, it, it was a 50-50 response sort of for and against. And people were responding saying, oh, but there's lots of scams and people, it's a yeah. cash economy, people don't know. And just those responses made me understand that people aren't really understanding the difference between cryptocurrency Which, and digital currencies, which are one thing, and um, the blockchain, which is another. Because blockchain is, is a software which can essentially facilitate a lot of processes, whereas cryptocurrency is something that uses the blockchain, but is used for, for money or yeah. as an asset. Yeah, but this is a debate that uh, goes all over the world mm -hmm. because uh, real estate and cryptocurrencies are two different businesses. Yes. Uh, so the real estate uh, is uh, well known for uh, its... Uh, a reliable well uh, cryptocurrencies haven't shown themselves mm. to be a reliable yet not yet not yet so. i mean personally i think blockchain has a lot of potential cryptocurrency i'm not so sure digital currencies yes however yes. Um, i do you know like a digital euro which has been yeah, discussed at digital the dollar yeah this i think is is possibly the way forward um okay thank you very much for joining me and thank for you giving for me having your expertise. me thank you for invitation Moving on to Kosovo now. The situation in the north of Kosovo and with neighbouring Serbia has continued to simmer this week as three Kosovo policemen that Pristina says were kidnapped by Serbian authorities from within its territory remain in custody. While slow to react at first, the EU and the US have called on Serbia to release the captives without conditions while reiterating calls for both sides to come back to Brussels for dialogue. Meanwhile, the West remains firm in its demands that Kosovo withdraw Albanian mayors from the north, withdraw special police units and implement the controversial Association of Serb Municipalities, something agreed on in 2013, but ruled unconstitutional in 2015. A late night meeting in Brussels between the EU and each country's respective leader yielded little in the way of results. Since 26th of May, when tensions reached heights not seen since the end of the Kosovo-Serbia war in 1999, it seems to many that the stance towards Kosovo has been harsher than usual, and much harsher than the one taken with Belgrade. Today, I'm speaking with two Western voices who've spoken out in strong support of Kosovo during these challenging times. Joining me on the phone is Conservative MP and Chair of the UK's Foreign Affairs Committee, Alicia Kearns. Um, Alicia, now, in a tweet last week, you called out the use of words detained and arrestation by the EU's Chief Diplomat, Joseph Borrell. Uh, this week, you've also questioned the wording of a statement from the EU delegation in Kosovo, Kosovo regarding a license for the TV station Clan Kosovo. And I saw you also noted the praise for the Serbian-led Platinum Wolf military exercise. Meanwhile, Kosovo was kicked out of Defender 2023. Uh, can you elaborate for us what is it about the language coming out of EU, inst EU institutions right now which is bothering you? No, absolutely. I think my concern comes down to balance and proportionality of the way in which particularly the US and the EU are responding to heightened tensions in Kosovo. Um, the reality is, that if we go back to what has underpinned this crisis, it is the decision by Serbia to commit foreign interference in domestic elections within Kosovo. Um, that is what has essentially caused and underlined the, conf uh, the, the conflict we're seeing currently in the rising tensions. 
My concern is that we all want to see de-escalation, but instead what we have seen is our democratic partner denigrated and punished whilst an increasingly autocratic country has been embraced and there has been no meaningful repercussion, despite that they have arbitrarily detained or kidnapped three Kosovar police officers. The unwillingness of countries or well, organisations like the EU to call it arbitrary or illegal detention, to recognise that kidnapping has taken place or for any punishment to be put in place is unforgivable. And the fact that essentially the US has gone ahead with this exercise again shows disproportionate because if we're saying that mayors trying to take up their legal right to an office deserves for Kosovo to be kicked out of a military exercise, then surely the kidnapping, the illegal uh, detention of three uh, Kosovo police officers should also result in Serbia not being allowed to participate in a military exercise. I mean, yes, what you say is, is completely logical. So you think um, that the EU is taking an unbalanced approach, EU and the US, towards Kosovo and Serbia. But I guess my question is, why? Why are they being like this? Ultimately, this is a failure of deterrence diplomacy. And what have we seen over the last two decades? A consistent failure to stand up to those who embrace autocracy and who do not uh, necessarily engage meaningfully in international processes. So, for example, Kosovo here is our democratic partner. Kosovo is the one that is agreeing uh, to participate in sanctions and to fully support the international community and the EU community when it comes to Ukraine. Whereas in contrast, you have Vucic saying that his hand is broken and will be for four years so that he cannot sign an agreement explicitly to help de-escalate the situation. You have Vucic signing a foreign policy agreement with Russia many months after the renewed illegal invasion of Ukraine. All I am calling for here is not punishment of Serbia. In fact, one of the things I think we should be talking about more here is how do we support Serb Kosovo communities? Very few people are asking about what they want. Very few people are hearing their voices. But actually, I'm asking for balance. It is wrong to denigrate and punish democratic partner and for there to be no repercussions for very serious um, actions from a partner that cannot be relied on. And actually, I, I interviewed some people from this, um, the Kosovo Serb community a couple of weeks ago, and you know they want the association established, they want, uh, you know, their rights enshrined further, etc. But more than anything, they they just want to, life to return back to normal in many ways. Um, now, another question is: currently, there are five EU member states who don't recognise Kosovo. Um, then we have Borrell, who's from Spain, who's obviously a key figure in the dialogue process. Spain doesn't recognise Kosovo. We have Lajcak in, in charge of the dialogue process from Slovakia, which doesn't recognise Kosovo. And we have Oliver Varheli in charge of enlargement, who's from Hungary, who does recognise Kosovo, um, but has very close ties with Serbia and Russia. Can the EU seriously lead the dialogue process when we consider these points? So I think there is a fundamental challenge around the fact that the EU does not have unity on this issue. I think EU member states would, would appreciate and recognise the fact that there is no unity amongst the EU around this. However, when it comes to individuals, I do believe that these are professional and highly experienced diplomats. So I genuinely believe, and I have to believe, that they would act in the best interests of stability in Europe and not in line with those those actions of their own countries. But of course, I'm disappointed that when they were leading figures within their own systems, they chose not to help ensure the Kosovo was recognised. But I've met with Lajcek. He's been very positive. It's been very helpful to have those meetings and discussions with him. For me, this is about the EU being divided as an institution. This is not about the individuals themselves who I have not seen any reason to uh, essentially bring their individual actions into, into question. It's good to hear. It's something I've been thinking about all morning. You know, can they draw the line professionally? I hope they can. You know, it's something. But I think there's an issue as well that this could lead to mistrust amongst Kosovars as well, who are thinking, you know, their countries don't recognise us. Can we trust them to lead this? Um, that was something that came across my mind over coffee this morning. 
Sure. I, I mean, look, I think this, the EU is completely sincere in wanting stability. They want to de-escalate the situation. And that is what those individuals are working to do. And of course, we don't know what the necessarily the personal views of those individuals are. Just because their country chose not to recognise Kosovo doesn't mean that they were not personally of that mm -hmm. view. So I think it's very important that we trust that the EU is trying to uh, act from a neutral position who genuinely wants to end the escalations. But I would just challenge them on the fact that, that you cannot have the EU many days on not commenting on the kidnap, the illegal detention of Kosovo police. And then when you do see it, what we did see around the arrests of the Kosovo police, the illegal arrests, was we did actually see you know, both sides being called on to de-escalate. The problem was that when we had the mayoral issue, which was ill-considered, and the reality is that many K4 soldiers were seriously hurt, so this was not a good thing. And I'm not an apologist um, for the fact that those atrocities, um, not atrocities, that those uh, activities took place. But we have to make sure that there is balance throughout. And the other big concern I have is that when we talk about what happens uh, in the north of Kosovo, there is a lack of conversation. I have not seen one international leader recognise or talk about the fact that there are armed militia funded and armed operating in North Kosovo, who are moving arms across the border on a daily basis within Kosovo. Um, and the reality is that if individuals in northern Kosovo choose not to support these armed militias, there is evidence of them finding grenades on their doorsteps um, in essentially blackmailing and intimidating them into helping them. There is evidence of efforts to intimidate and antagonise K4 soldiers to escalate the situation. Why is there no international conversation taking place about dealing with these armed militias, which are Belgrade backed and funded? It's a very good question, and I thank you for raising these questions publicly and for, for having this discussion with me. Alicia, thank you very much for your time, and please keep up um, your, your strong views on this. That's very kind. Thank you. Thank you. But it's not just the EU that's been criticised. The US, much loved in the region and a key investor and facilitator, has also been accused of being unfair in, in its response to Kosovo while Serbia remains somewhat unscathed. I spoke with Richie Torres, congressman for the Bronx in New York, and someone who has spoken loudly in support of Kosovo. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining me today. Now, as you mentioned earlier this week, Kosovo has emerged as one of the most democratic countries in the Western Balkans, and it's made huge progress since its independence. Meanwhile, Serbia, although it's an EU candidate country, has experienced democratic backsliding in almost all areas, and it's also refused to align with EU and US foreign policy on Russia. Yet, we're seeing what appears to be the burden of resolving the current crisis being placed on Kosovo. Why is this? I wish I knew the answer to your, to your question. Um, you know, Kosovo is becoming more democratic, not less where Serbia is becoming more autocratic, not less. Uh, Kosovo is unwaveringly allied with the West, whereas Serbia is essentially an, an, a, a satellite in the orbit of Russia. Despite these differences, the United States and Europe appear to be taking a one-sided approach that favors Serbia and disfavors Kosovo. Uh, why on earth would the United States denounce Kosovo for seating democratically elected mayors, which is an exercise of national sovereignty, without denouncing Serbia for inciting instability in the North. And notice that the European Union has said nothing about the apprehension of the Kosovar police officers at the hands of the Serbian regime. So there's a real perception of a double standard within the Albanian diaspora and among elected officials who are supportive of the Albanian diaspora, such as myself. The, the silence from the European Union is deafening. And, and it's just, it's inexplicable to me, you know, what is the West going to gain from a policy of appeasing an autocratic Serbia and alienating a democratic Kosovo? You know, Kosovo has been shown to be the strongest democracy in the Western Balkans, according to independent assessments. Kosovo is so democratic that it secured a more than $200 million grant from the U.S. Millennium Challenge Corporation, uh, which is a recognition of the progress that Kosovo has made 
toward good governance, uh, whereas Serbia is moving in the exact opposite direction. And Serbia is one of the few countries in the Western Balkans that refuses to sanction Vladimir Putin for his illegal invasion of Ukraine. Do you think a soft stance from the West could help improve the popularity of the US, EU and NATO in Belgrade and draw it away from Russia? Do you think this is perhaps on the minds of the State Department? I fear the opposite. I fear we're going to see the worst of both worlds. We're going to, we're going to gain no goodwill from Serbia while alienating an ally like Kosovo. And, you know, we're living in a time where American influence might be on the decline and we cannot take our allies for granted. We have to be proactive in preserving our alliances. Um, Vladimir Putin, it has been reported, is the most popular figure in Serbia. Uh, th there's no evidence that the policy of appeasing Serbia is going to elevate the standing of the United States and the EU within Serbia. I, I, I'm, I'm skeptical about it. I saw some when, I, when I go to Kosovo, there's a deep reservoir of, of goodwill and loyalty toward the United States. Um, you know, I've jokingly said there's more love for the United States in Kosovo than there is in the United States. Um, and so why on earth would we want to squander that goodwill? I, I, I want to see a normalization of relations. Uh, the highest priority should be to secure recognition of Kosovo as an independent state and an integration of Kosovo first into the European Union and NATO, and ultimately into the international community. That should remain the policy of both Europe and the United States. Um, but I worry that the, 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 the dialogue has become more of a sword than a shield. Instead of operating as a shield that protects the independence of Kosovo, it has become a sword that Serbia weaponizes against Kosovo. Like, Basic local decisions like enforcing license plates are subject to the dialogue. <laughs> and, and so Serbia has managed to weaponize the dialogue process to infringe upon the sovereignty and the independence of Kosovo, which is the opposite of how the dialogue should be operated. Now, I've spoken to politicians and analysts from many countries locally and further afield on this issue, and I'm going to ask you the same question. As the EU has five non-recognisers amongst its ranks, do you think it's capable of leading the Kosovo-Serbia dialogue? Do you think the US could be better placed to lead the way? Well, I'm in favour of the United States playing a stronger role. Um, and I worry that the non-recognisers are part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Um, and those recognisers should do the right thing and, and recognise the independence of Kosovo. Uh, uh, and, and I find it strange that the point person on foreign affairs for the European, European Union comes from a country that refuses to recognize Kosovo. And so, how, how you know, if you're a, a Kosovar, you have no, you're skeptical about the neutrality of the dialogue process, knowing that it's being run partly by non-recognizers. Now, I just want to throw in one last wildcard question. If you had Kurti and Vucic in a room together, and you could impress something upon them, what would it be? I would tell both sides to honor their obligations under the Brussels Agreement and the ORID Agreement. But I would be crystal clear to Serbia that we will have zero tolerance for the instability that it's causing in the North. That is a violation of the sovereignty of Kosovo. It is unacceptable, and the West should have zero tolerance for it. Representative Torres, thank you very much for your time. Just before I go, U.S. Ambassador Yuri Kim gave a farewell press conference in Tirana this week where she spoke of the developments during her three and a half year mandate. Kim has been subject to intense public and personal scrutiny, which has sometimes gone far beyond what a public figure should expect. This has included direct personal attacks from politicians, fake news, targeted harassment in the online sphere and even misinformation. When asked by myself and Inside Albania whether this experience has impacted her overall impression, she had this to say. The truth is that it has been a pleasure to be in this country. As in any capital city, uh, there is a chattering class. There are a few loud voices that uh, pretend to speak for everybody. I'd like to know the truth. And that's why I uh, made uh, the effort to visit all 61 municipalities in this beautiful country. 
and to get to know people, to have conversations that were not planned, um, and uh, to try to uh, find out what are people thinking about? What do they hope for their children? Um, what do they think about the future? What do they like? What do they not like? I hope that those persons and that every citizen in Albania knows that they should never, never be afraid to speak the truth, speak the truth, confront people that you believe have power, confront people, confront power, speak truth. That's it for this week. You can follow Inside Albania every Saturday on Euronews Albania, on our YouTube channel and on all major podcasting platforms. Inside Albania, Vetem Euronews, Miro Pavsin.